Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim. Tonight at our College of Complexes, we're going to be hearing from Andy Anderson on what is happening in America. This is E. Anderson, research analyst of the Northwest Information Service. We'll talk about the database translations of environmental, political, and social issues into basic English. He will tell us a little bit of an update on the state of our country and what he feels might be the way forward. I want to emphasize that the college has basically two rules. One is one fool at a time. The other is no personal attacks. And right now I'm working from the house. The college consists of the following format. There will be a brief announcements period. Then we'll have a question and answer. I mean, we will have a brief announcements period. Our presenter will present. Then we'll have a question and answer period, followed up by our infamous rebuttal. All right. Let's welcome Andy Anderson. Tonight the presentation is going to be uh, a little different than what I've done in the past. One thing, um, we're going to allow people, uh, I would encourage it, uh, I'm going to be talking for about eight minutes a piece, it would be about 40 minutes of a talk on five specific subjects on which there is an enormous database. Well, I, what I call a database is like the database of published evidence on the health hazard of cigarette smoking or the health hazards of breathing asbestos dust and fibers. There's, there's a huge body of forensic evidence published on those. It took 30, 40, 50 years for the lawsuits to come up through the courts in order to get the information out to the public that the, the billionaires running those uh, corporations were paying scientists to create doubt, saying there's no problem with secondhand smoke, no problem with uh, firsthand smoke. There's doubt. And uh, I'll hold up a book periodically that uh, gives you a reference. Merchants of Doubt is uh, a current book that summarizes what's called the tobacco strategy, where you pay professors in colleges, universities, you pay people to produce good sounding research reports claiming that there's doubt on the issue. Right now, the same people that were creating doubt in the tobacco industry have shifted over to taking money from the fossil fuel industry to create doubt on global warming, doubt where there is none. It, and, uh, and wherever you find people creating doubt on these things where there is none, they're using what's called the tobacco strategy because it was so successful. In about 1969 or so, the internal documents in the tobacco industry said the science of tobacco causing cancer, leukemia, heart disease, the science is so well known and so solid that there's no longer any way to combat the body of fact so now our primary product is doubt. Create doubt and paralyze the Congress. That's Naomi Oreskes and Eric M. Conway. It's one of the best books you can have describing what our media is doing, how they, they the media will give, they, they give a balanced presentation, in other words. They allow a scientist from uh, the doubting side to be compared with a scientist from the, the forensic evidence real world side. And they make it look like there's a debate, like there's an even debate going on between 3% of the world scientists that say there's no such thing as global warming, and the other 97% who have published the forensic evidence showing that global warming climate change is accepted, it's not a myth, it's human cause, and we have to do something about it. So, for the last 30, 35 years, since 1982, 83, my brother and I have had a hobby. And you know, have, we, we work on furnaces and air conditioners for a living, but as a hobby, we run what's called the Northwest Information Service, and we translate books, like the books that I have here tonight. We, uh, we read books, and we, we specialize on whacked out subjects, things that reporters can get fired for writing about. 
the number one blacked out book in America where you never see any negative or positive reviews or bad reviews. There is no reviews in the media every year, virtually none. People working in bookstores for years don't even know this book is on the shelf, and it's a nationwide bestseller. It's called Censored. You know, and this is the 40th anniversary edition, 40th anniversary of Censored News, Censored 2017. It comes out of Sonoma State University. It's Project Censored. The students and professors sort through about 300 stories from around the country and they call it down to the top 25 that would change America overnight if they were covered rather than blacked out. So th this is, a, if you had only uh, the money and the effort to read one book a year, I would recommend this one. They also have a website where you can read all the last you know, 20 years, the archives. It's called projectcensored.org. It's ProjectCensored.org, incidentally, is one of the two references that I listed. There's not a lot of references listed on the back of this sheet, which is an outline for the five subjects we're going to be talking about tonight, because on each of these five topics, there's hundreds, hundreds of documented, peer-reviewed, scientifically solid references where the information is non-debatable, like, like the database on asbestos, the database on cigarette smoking. The database that shows, are you guys okay back there? The, the, the database on the flat versus round earth issue. There, there's 2,000 members in the Flat Earth Society in England. But you would look like a pretty out of touch with reality idiot if you took the flat earth side of a debate and actually stood up at a podium and tried to debate with somebody the round earth data. Because you got a group like Al, what I've referred to as Albert Einstein and his friends, 500 physicists saying, hey, we got pictures from the space shuttle. The earth is round, it's not flat. Well, it's at some point on each of these subjects, the database of peer reviewed evidence gets so big that it's no longer debatable. And the only way to keep Americans from finding out about it is what this book talks about, Censored News. The media does two things. They run, they promote the myth 24-7 on all channels, yeah, yeah, the, the, the official story, 24-7 all channels, while they're simultaneously running a blackout on what we call Albert Einstein and 500 of his friends in his physics department saying, hey, the earth is right flat, it's round. We have to black out Albert and his friends, like, uh, for instance, Albert and his friends from the group called Architects and Engineers, or uh, Firefighters and Police for 9-11. They published an enormous amount of data on the forensic evidence of what really happened on 9-11. So Americans are being maintained in a bubble of ignorance by the media, who is still teaching that we were, we were attacked by 19 crazed Muslims on 9-11. It's a total myth. In the rest of the world has known it since 9-12. So, um, that pretty much covers the introduction. Hold on one sec. I knew, I knew people in those buildings, I tell you. Set my timer here so it will it'll jog my memory every seven minutes or so. So we'll have uh, an equal amount of time for these five subjects. And as I said, as we're going through and, and talking about the database, I'll hold up some books as references. Each of this pile of books is forms references uh, of the database of the work of you know tens of thousands of man years or woman years worth of scientific research published on each of these subjects. Nothing tonight uh, that I talk about will be in the realm of anybody's opinion. It'll be in the realm of thousands of scientists that have published the forensic evidence. Many of them have gotten Nobel Prizes, Pulitzer Prizes, and this is what we do is do a collective summary of you know, a whole bunch of books. Uh, if you don't have time to read 15 or 20 books on a subject in a year or two, you get a, a summary. You know, we publish one-page summaries. This is a summary, basically a quick summary of five of the subjects, but th that's what we've been doing since 1983, is publishing these database summaries for people that don't have time to read 
a lot of books on blacked out subjects. So let's get right into it. Uh, what's happening in America today? Uh, number one, you see on, on the issue, uh, millions of people have, for good reason, have not yet accepted uh, the media's idea of calling Donald Trump the president. Donald Trump is not the elected president of the United States. Donald Trump is a buffoon, carnival barker, corporate criminal who lost the election and was installed in that office by a group of billionaire predators. Uh, he lost the election smartly by several million votes and then in three blue states they simply changed, they had control of voting machines and they changed the electoral vote totals to make it look like he won. Uh, so we're in the same, you know, we're in our uh, 17th year now of Bush-Cheney crimes. Bush and Cheney lost both elections. They, uh, they were installed the first time by the Supreme Court. Uh, the censored news books since 2001 yeah. have been covering uh, the issue of our electronic voting machines <laughs> yeah. and stolen elections. We've had nothing but stolen elections since 2002 where, uh, where they use electronic voting machines to keep Republican criminals in office when they are actually being quoted out in Democratic landslides. So they just change the vote totals after midnight and come out and announce the Republican winner. Greg Palast, uh, who has written a book called uh, Vultures, where is it? Greg Palast is the number one uh, investigating reporter. His stories are front page news. Not here, they're front page news in uh, newspapers in England. They publish his stories on the stolen elections, the election fraud by uh, when the, we got electronic voting machines that Help America Vote Act in 2002. They started putting machines into key states where you need to change the vote totals to keep Republican criminals in office and to elect Republican criminals, criminals masquerading as Republicans. I call them crime acts. They're criminals masquerading as Congress critters, masquerading as Republicans. We have a as, as uh, Jim Hightower said, you have a high percentage of criminals masquerading as Republicans in the Republican Party. And why is that? Well, if you look at the legislation, especially right now, look at the legislation that's being passed by the Trump administration. In order to pass that kind of legislation, you need perverts. You need sexual perverts who can be blackmailed into voting for stuff that's toxic and insane or you need people that are psychologically perverted and have no ethics, no morals, and no conscience. So the Republican Party itself has been quietly weeding out anybody with ethics, morals, or a conscience since 2002. The Republican Party is made up of a very high percentage of people that have no ethics, morals, and conscience and can or are can or are being blackmailed by billionaires who have archives of videotapes of these many of these congressmen in Washington having sex, they're pedophiles, and they have sex with young boys and girls. That's spelled out in books. Uh, the first one was called The Franklin Scandal, came out about 1990. The Franklin Savings Alone, out of the uh, it was Franklin in, in Nebraska, uh, the, the guy that embezzled uh, billions of dollars in the savings alone, a Republican named Larry King, was also running a pedophile ring, supplying young boys and girls to high-ranking Republicans in the Reagan-Bush administration. And that scandal ran all the way to the top of the White House. So when people started to investigate, a couple of the early investigators got killed and everybody ran for cover, realizing that the state police in Nebraska were in on the cover. So uh, the first book uh, written by Nick Bryant is called The Franklin Scandal, The Franklin Cover-Up, later Child Abuse, Satanism, and Murder in Nebraska. It's called, uh, that's what it's called, The Franklin Cover-Up. It's a paperback. You know, this is a life-changing book. You read this, and it helps you understand 
how our so-called Republican Congress critters can be producing and passing legislation that is just morally and ethically toxic sludge, like the Bush administration. The Bush name in 2008, anybody standing near a Bush had no hope of getting reelected. Uh, the Republicans were uh, chucked out of Congress and the Senate in record numbers in 2008 by a Republican, a landslide of people that realized we're voting criminals out. We're not voting Democrat or Republican. We're voting criminals out of office. So for a couple of years, the Democrats had control of the Senate and Congress. But there were a few people that were on the billionaire payroll in the Democratic Party, and it was enough to paralyze the party. So they claimed that with a 60, 60 to 40 majority in the Senate, they didn't have enough votes to get anything done. So that's where we are on that subject, if you want to know why our political system in America is so toxic at the national level. Number two on this list. Can you say who the Democrats were that were corrupt? Uh, you talk about, the question was, uh, who were the, uh, the cor if you want a list of the corrupt Democrats, log on to Greg Palast's website. Greg Palast, as I think it's gregpalast.com, has a website that gives you uh, the list of corrupt Democrats and, you know, who stayed in office, who was helped get, you know, uh, Corrupt people that were voted in and out, election corruption. The palace site is the best one I know. Okay. Um, number two here is the U.S. military annual budget of nearly a trillion dollars a year. Amer Seventy-five. You know, we have 90, 95 percent of the world's people outside the United States and all other countries spend about the same amount of money as the U.S. military with five percent of our people <coughs> spends. So, that amount of spending uh, is Reverend Jesse, not, uh, it was Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King said that any society that spends more money on the military and machinery to kill people than it spends on social programs and, and people that help, you know, help people live better, programs that uplift people, any society that spends more on the military and machinery of death is itself approaching spiritual death. And that is where we are today. There's all kinds of books published about how the military budget, which is basically not ever talked about or debated in Congress. It, it's a given that we just pour money into the military and increase it every year. Donald Trump wants to increase our military budget by about 10% under the guise of rebuilding America's defenses. We saw that once before in 1980 where the, the Reaganite people, Ronald Reagan ran for office under the guise of rebuilding the military because the Soviets were ahead of us. Well, that was the work of George Bush and the CIA in 19... George Bush, H.W. Bush, from 76 to 80, they ran a program called Team B and they produced all kinds of reports uh, sh showing, you know, producing the false image, the false hopes that the Soviet Union was ahead of us and everything. They weren't. It was a total scam. We had more missiles, planes, bomber submarines. We had an obscene amount of nuclear weapons. We had uh, stockpiled between the Soviet Union and the American. We had stockpiled the nuclear equivalent of 6,800 World War II's worth of explosive power. 6,800. They were talking about defending against 3,000 incoming missiles while two of the best books on this subject you're ever going to see. You can still get, get copies online or uh, you know, through the uh, libraries. One is called Brittle Power uh, from 1981, talking about how vulnerable our whole nation and other nations are to uh, a sneak attack with a dozen compact nuclear weapons.
This book, With Enough Shovels, was written by Robert Shear. It described that one of the top people in the Reagan administration <coughs> talking about how nuclear war is not a problem. There is no problem with nuclear war as long, long as every American has his own shovel and can dig his own foxhole. It's called With Enough Shovels, Reagan, Bush, and Nuclear War. Now that man was uh, Thomas K. Jones. He was flying around the country giving these high-level speeches saying, we can defend against 3,000 incoming missiles. There's no problem. The doctors quit playing golf on Wednesdays and formed a group called Physicians for Social Responsibility. They said, Thomas K. Jones is an example of insanity on the hoof, prime beef as it were. He's not in some insane asylum somewhere. He's in the president's cabinet. Well, today, Trump is appointing the descendants of Thomas K. Jones on virtually every major office in this country now, <clears throat> high office, has someone who is a, a, a spiritual a kin to Thomas K. Jones holding insane views on every key federal subject. They like the, uh, whoever is in charge of the Environmental Protection Agency says, we don't need to protect the environment. We'll get a whole new planet when Jesus returns. We've got to destroy this one first. Put him in charge of the EPA. Same thing with uh, people in charge of uh, the health, education, and welfare. People in charge of the educational community. Uh, who is it? Betsy DeVos is going to be in charge of uh, national education. She wants to privatize all the schools. Get rid of public schools and just let's make big profits off our kids in private schools. And there's all kinds of a database showing that these private charter schools where they're making a profit off our kids are giving a way worse public and uh, worse education than the, the public schools that are funded and supported publicly. So if we come to grips as other countries have and spend only a fraction of our national budget on defense. General Smedley Butler, I don't have his book, General Butler published a book called War is a Racket in 1935. He said, draw a 200 mile radius around the United States and let the public defend, uh, let, let the Navy and the Army defend that radius. We shouldn't be, have troops in 800 bases all over the world killing people who are protesting to our oil companies and others that are uh, raping their land and killing their people when they protest it. The mili U.S. military, that's another one of the big myths. The U.S. military hasn't been fighting for freedom and justice anywhere in the world since the Korean War. What they've been doing is helping overthrow democratically elected governments who want to use their oil and resources to help better their own people. So that's the essence of that one. Number three on this list <clears throat> Number three on this list is perhaps the easiest and the least controversial to understand because there's so many professional groups that have gotten involved. There's professional groups of every stripe you can think of. Anybody that you respect firefighters, police, architects and engineers, uh, military officers, for, in the, in the military intelligence officers, hundreds of them. There's a group called Patriots Question 9-11. Uh, that will give you a summary of those different sites and groups of people. Architects and engineers, incidentally, has been running a, a global education program where their people have been going to other countries and holding seminars, giving speeches. The world has been getting educated on the hoax of 9-11 since uh, really about 2003 when a lot of these groups shifted into high gear. That, that subject is, as I said, it, the media runs a two-pronged process. They promote the myth that we were attacked by 19 crazed Muslims. That myth is promoted on all channels 24-7, and they black out the, the thousands and thousands of scientists and researchers with all different stripes on the forensic evidence that shows seven buildings, seven old office buildings, 
were prepped with explosives. Seven office buildings and a money losing complex that had been slated for demolition since 1993. They couldn't figure out how to do it without being sued for spreading asbestos dust all over Lower Manhattan. So they, uh, along about the middle of uh, 19, you know, 2001 or 2000, they started prepping and planning for the event we know as 9 11. Uh, uh, Larry Silverstein, who owned Building 7, is a billionaire developer. He got together with some of the people that in, in, uh, were installed in the Bush administration. And they said, if we take out billions and billions of dollars of terrorist insurance on these buildings and then have our friends in the media set up cameras, we'll fill the destruction of the first two and we'll sell it to Americans as an attack by 19 crazed Muslims. That's what they did. They, you know, a lot of people did not know that there was a third tower that came down in a classic controlled demolition at 5.20 in the afternoon. The media was reporting the destruction of that tower 25 minutes before they triggered the explosives. So it's just one of the pieces of uh, videotape evidence you can see. Every piece of what we were told about 9-11 has been proven to be impossible to have happened that way. It's what's called a transparent conspiracy. They kill a bunch of people in broad daylight, they blame it on the enemies of the countries you want to invade. And at the second time, the official story they put out is so transparently impossible that it's called a transparent conspiracy. It's a message to anybody that starts to investigate saying, this is the official story, and if you start to investigate this, you can lose your job or your life. This is why the Democrats from 9-11, September 11th to 2006, when the American public got behind and, uh, politicians and voted some out and began to take control of the country in 2006. For five years, the Democratic, the decent people just basically laid flat on the floor in the Senate and Congress and did not impose, oppose the Bush politicians in any shape or manner. The reason for that was, after they looked at the official story of 9-11, the intelligent people that knew what was going on said, hey, we're not dealing with politicians here in the Bush administration, we're dealing with killers. And if we stand up and oppose them, any one of us can be assassinated, just like Senator Paul Wellstone was 10 days before the election in 2002. Paul Wellstone was assassinated, <coughs> and a uh, Republican was uh, running that office to take control back to the Senate. So people that investigated 9-11, people that investigated the anthrax mailings, which were American, came out of Fort uh, Detrick. Uh, the anthrax mailings were a total inside job. As soon as it became uh, obvious that that was a strain of American anthrax, weaponized anthrax, the subjects just disappeared from the media. There was no investigation whatsoever. So 9-11 is uh, like a giant poisonous tree that was planted in America and we have fruits of that poisonous tree growing off as branches in every direction. Donald Trump is just simply one of the fruits of that poisonous tree. You know, you know, uh, Homeland Security is another one. The militarization of police in, around uh, various states where the police are just comfortable getting out of their car, going over and pumping 12 bullets into somebody that's unarmed. These things wouldn't be possible without the shift in mentality that happened to America when we began militarizing America in the wake of 9-11. 9-11 was created to be our new Pearl Harbor to motivate the American public and the Congress to support the takedown of seven countries in five years. Donald Trump and the others are quoted. If you go on the Patriots question 9-11, you'll see them quoting these officials saying, after 9-11, 9-11 is the tool that will get us started, and we're going to take down seven Middle Eastern countries in five years that, would, that are uh, slowing down the expansion of Israel and Israel's territory. So, uh, and of course, that's another thing that's radioactive. You cannot talk about or criticize anything that Israel is doing because Israel, uh, the Mossad and the others have banks of videotapes 
of our senators and congressmen having sex with young boys and girls. They, they blackmail them. So uh, it's a huge blackmail ring going on in Washington, D.C. And it's spelled out from 20 years ago, 30 years ago, in those books on the Franklin scandal. Any questions so far? Uh, anybody want a reference, or is that enough references for you? Okay. You said for um, Greg Palace. Greg Palace uh, for the voting? Yeah, yeah. Palace, P A L A C E. P A L A S T. It's, it's Greg oh, Palace. Okay. P A L A S T. Greg Palace is an investigative reporter that reports on uh, stolen elections, because the corporate control with voting yeah. machines and how Republican criminals are maintaining an office, especially in 24, 2014, 2014, like two elections ago, one, 89 Republican criminals in the House were kept in as the electronic voting machines red shifted the total after these people were voted out by people sick and tired of the criminals doing their criminal dirty work. So the House would be solidly Democratic had the electronic voting machines not been used to redshift the total a few percentage points after midnight and make it look like the Republicans won in a squeaker. That's what they're doing. Okay, let's go on to number four. You, you said a question? Uh, you want a reference? No, I was wondering, how, how do you make all these accusations against the Republicans that they're pedophiles and, and uh, uh, sexual perverts. Uh, this is a your, your thirty year old books there. I, I wouldn't even read those. Those are thirty years old those books over there. Okay. Uh, they quite they, they, uh, we I mean, he, uh, the gentleman here missed my introduction. My uh, we've got uh, evidence these books, the database of evidence was piling up thirty years ago. And it takes in America it takes twenty or thirty years. Censor News talks about the increasing time lag it takes between when the database is solid and when it finally creeps out in the media. The, the time lag between when something is solid and when it finally gets covered in the media is getting longer and longer. The media is able to cover up a database on something where the database is bigger and solid. The database on the pedophiles and uh, blackmail of our congressmen and everything else is way bigger and more solid today than when these 30-year-old books was published. What I'm giving you is not somebody's opinion or accusations. This is documented by uh, court cases and everything that have been settled out of court and hushed up by the media. It's very much like the documented evidence on the pedophile priests in the Catholic Church. It's not, a, it's not an un, unsubstantiated investigation or slander that the Catholic Church has some pedophile priest problem. They covered it up for 30 years, 40 years, and that's what we're talking about here. I'm talking about databases of stuff that's been covered up for 30 and 40 years. Not somebody's a single scientist, a, a controversial statement or accusation that has no basis in reality, just the opposite. Okay? So if, if you have, I'll give you more references during the questions and answer periods coming up in just a few minutes. New Republicans, George. Yeah. That's okay, the, the name fourth calling. What? name calling and McCarthyism. That's what that's what you are. Okay, uh, again, we're not talking about name calling and McCarthyism. Well, it's not name calling and McCarthyism to say that certain pedophile priests were elected and prosecuted by the media. These are police records. We'll These are the documented. The Republicans. You, 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 I'm, I'm talking. Well, though they are documented, it's just it's one of the things they're pedophiles. that's blacked out. Yes, there are documented pedophiles, and you can get a list of Republicans that have been uh, voted out or removed from their offices and prosecuted for their pedophile activities. It's in that book called The Franklin Scandal and others, and modern ones. Uh, you know, the, all you need to do is do a Google search on the internet, Republican pedophiles, and you come up with thousands and thousands of hits. Okay, let's move on. Yeah, I guess so. The fourth, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the book, Merchants of Doubt, All Republicans are pedophiles. Uh, from the peanut gallery back there, I did not say that all Republicans were pedophiles. I said a high percentage have those tendencies or uh, could be blackmailed for other things. 
But what I meant was, and you can look it up, the Republican Party is weeding out people with ethics, morals, and a conscience that would vote to help the American middle class rather than shovel money to billionaires. Uh, uh, a classic example is the, the Koch brothers fund various think tanks around this country who pour money into elections to get Republicans elected, Republicans that have basically no ethics, no morals, and no conscience. Republicans that will vote for uh, getting rid of the bills that protect the environment. Yeah. Republicans that will vote uh, for the installation of right-wing politicians masquerading as judges. Republicans that will support the idea of Citizens United to vote in 2010 that the Supreme Court said it's now legal to buy and sell politicians. You, we have the Republic, we have billionaires buying and selling politicians who are mostly Republicans. Of, of the total amount of money being poured into buying and selling politicians, probably 90% of the money is going into the Republican Party. That's the party they took over, and that's the party that's in power right today. You guys have a question back there? Had they set the explosives on 9 11? Uh, if you log, you can log on to various uh, groups. There's websites all over the internet about how the buildings were packed with explosives, the forensic evidence. One of the best sites is called 911truth.org. Another site is called Patriots Question 911. Log on to that site, Patriots Question 911, and you'll get the forensic information and the websites, police, firefighters, architects and engineers, military intelligence officers, every kind of group you can think of is publishing forensic evidence. It's not somebody's opinion, okay? And as I said, uh, right right now. Well, how did they set it off? Judy Wood wrote a book. There, uh, I mean, were they building across the street at a big plunger? We don't have time, right? We can spend right. hours. We can spend hours uh, talking about the friends of evidence of 9/11. There's going to be a whole presentation on that coming up in September. Not somebody coming down from Rockford or anywhere else telling us about the official fairy tale. I'm going to give a summary of the published forensic evidence that, is, as Professor Griffin said, it's 30 over 7. You need a 30% open mind and a 7th grade education to understand this. You, you need a 30% open mind to step through the psychological barrier. When we get questions like, how did they do it, or it couldn't have been done, you're talking about somebody that hasn't mustered the psychological strength, in other words, to open their mind and step through the barrier and simply look at the forensic evidence. It's very easy to understand about how they did it and possibly who they did it. Who did it? Okay. What do we got? Um, let, me, uh, let me give you a couple of books on that. For those of you that want forensic evidence on 9 11 and want to have your questions answered, you can get a, a, a physics textbook that describes all the physics of how the buildings were demolished with explosives. It's in this textbook written by a physics professor. Uh, it's called Where Did the Towers Go? The Twin Towers went sideways in the wind as a cloud of dust after being dustified in the air by massive amounts of explosives. The Twin Towers were converted to dust. All it was left with was girders hitting the ground as the buildings were dustified and went sideways in the wind, rolled over Manhattan as a cloud of dust. Uh, it's censored 2011. You can look up. You can look up on the website, Censored News, the whole chapter in the Censored 2011. This book was a bestseller on the New York Times list for a week, believe it or not, because it has a chapter in it describing the forensic evidence that's known all over the world about the myth and the hoax of 9-11. What's it called, the book? This, this is Censored News. It's, it's part of, uh, Censored News from 20, 2006 to 2011 covered uh, the myth and the hoax of 9-11, the official fairy tale, is a complete hoax. Here's another book, books like this with uh, titles with the forensic evidence. It's, this one is called 9-11 Synthetic Terror. It's by 9-11 uh, Synthetic Terror, made in the USA, 
It's by Web Webster Griffin Tartley. And it says now, they, they, he lists the 46 different drills, military drills and uh, things that were simulating the actions of 9-11. They were running a bunch of different drills on the morning of 9-11. So the air traffic controllers couldn't tell if the blips on the screen, the military air traffic controllers couldn't tell either if these planes were real or if they were blips inserted by the military war games. So does anybody need other references? Uh, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll answer your questions in the questions and answer period. But uh, if anybody wants another reference, I can give you more. There's uh, dozens of books in my own collection on the hoax of 9-11. It's now known to be, and, and it's said to be, the largest, 9-11 is the single largest hoax it's never been perpetrated out of public in broad daylight. And the, the science is so solid that, it, as I said, it's, it's non-debatable. Other countries are publishing lists of the people that did it. Okay. And lastly, number five on this list, if you look at number five, we're looking at what uh, our capitalist system yeah. with the for-profit medical industrial complex has been able to uh, black out the forensic evidence and support the total. How are you guys doing back there? Uh, has anybody got a question I, I can answer and then move on? Uh, Charlie? Uh, okay. Um, the, the, the idea, the idea in America is still being promoted by our media that it's good for insurance companies to make obscene profits off of sick people. Our country stands alone. We are number one. We're alone in the world of modern countries. We're the only country that has a for-profit medical system rather than universal health care. And when you have a for-profit system, no amount of profit is ever enough. There's a book by Jim Myers called, uh, the, I think it's called The Trillion Dollar Conspiracy. But it taught, there's a chapter in there about uh, the, the top 20 drugs, where they, they make a bottle of pills, a monthly bottle of pills, and the chemicals are 11 cents for that bottle, and they sell it for 500 or $1,000. Um, right now, the pharmaceutical industry has the, the, the philosophy that if you can't afford $3,000 a month for your medication, well, that's tough. You just die. We have people in this country dying of things that people in other countries aren't dying of because they have universal health care. And you can go to a doctor and get treated, and you don't have to sell your house or go bankrupt if a kid gets sick. So we're coming, Professor McMurtry, John McMurtry out of Canada, 1999 published a book called The Cancer Stage of Capitalism. And he said, Capitalism that is, exists in the United States will get bigger and bigger. It starts out like a small cancer of cell, and it grows and grows until the, the cancer finally gets big. It's like a shark getting bigger and bigger until it just eats the host and kills everything in sight. And that's where we are. That's what Martin Luther King talked about in 1967. Any society that spends more on machinery of death and profits making money and profits off of killing people or letting people die is headed towards spiritual death. And along those lines, as I said, uh, you'll see it in the write-up, the latest medical crime that is coming to light, uh, the profit-driven crime, where they, they black out the side effects of certain drugs. There's, there's been birth control drugs that have been pulled off the market. There's been uh, drugs for heart diseases and stuff where uh, uh, drug antidepressants are a good example. There are some antidepressants that in the fine print it says, oh, by the way, um, they will help for antidepressants, but in young people, every now and then one of the side effects is uh, the young person will tend toward suicide. A lot of these people uh, just go off one day and kill a few people with guns and things. Uh, they've been on these antidepressant drugs. That's one of the side effects is they push people toward suicidal tendencies. They're banned in other countries, but they're not yet banned here. 
And as I said, uh, one of the things we've been following for the last 30 years or so, since 1987, is what's known to be now the hoax, total hoax of the AIDS epidemic. It's four, four things you need to know about the AIDS epidemic, and they've been absolutely here, solid and non-debatable since the year 2000, when our article was published by the, the Rethinking AIDS Group, the scientific group for the reappraisal of AIDS. You'll find that group on their original site called VirusMyth. There's 2,700 scientists and doctors in that one site that have been publishing research papers all over the world saying HIV is harmless. Basically. What's it called? It's called VirusMyth. Dot com, or I, I think it's a dot com, not a dot org. But anyway. What were they dying of? All those people? What, what, what question you have? If not AIDS, what were they dying of? Well, the, the, the two things, like I said, it, it becomes, sure. Professor uh, David Rasnick wrote an article in 2000 called The AIDS Wonder, How Could It Happen? And he said, uh, once you see it, and, and uh, it's easy to understand how this happened. The money poured into research, the money poured into research to research how HIV makes people sick. That money is so huge that if you publish the results of your research saying we can't find any way that HIV makes people sick, that it's harmless, you are instantly blackballed. Your research money is cut off, you're a pariah, you can lose your job, your university doesn't get any more money. They will blackball the NIH and, uh, and the other federal funding groups that have been promoting the AIDS epidemic. They will cut off the funding instantly and blackball any professor that publishes his results in this country saying that HIV is harmless. The original uh, discoverer, co-discoverer of HIV, the original guy that got credit for it was a doctor in France called Dr. Luc Montagnier. In 1983, he published the results thinking HIV caused AIDS. It took him seven years. And then in 1990, he started going to AIDS conferences. And he was very quickly turned into a pariah. He said, here's the Jesus of HIV. And they threw him out of the temple because he started saying in 1990, hey, I woke up. Uh, my research now shows that other things are making people sick. We were wrong. We got a lot of sick people, a lot of sick people from a variety of illnesses, but HIV is not causing it. The idea that HIV was making these people sick was made up and announced at a press conference by Margaret Heckler and uh, Dr. Robert Gallo in 1984. Dr. Gallo was later censored by the scientific community and his papers on AIDS were withdrawn as being scientifically fraudulent. And in, in, in 2000, uh, the, one of the founders of the uh, Rethinking AIDS group, the scientific group, the reappraisal of AIDS. The, they published an article called the AIDS Wonder, How Could It Happen? And they said, you need to know four things. HIV is harmless. It's not the cause of what's making people sick. AIDS is not, a, AIDS is not sexually transmitted or infectious of any kind. Uh, there's no evidence of that anywhere in the world. It's not an infectious syndrome. Third, uh, AIDS, you know, AIDS is not infectious or contagious. And anti-HIV drugs, the medicine, was fatal toxic chemotherapy drugs. The HIV drugs were responsible for the death toll. Starting in 1987, when the drug AZT was put in the capsules and put on the market, AZT was a fatal chemotherapy drug left over from the 60s. Burroughs Welcome said in their official documents, Burroughs Welcome, the company that made the drug, said when this goes on the market, we are going to kill two birds with one stone. We're going to make billions because people will sell their life insurance, their houses. People will do anything to get hand, their hands on the drug that will stretch out their life a little bit. And there will be no survivors. People on this medicine taking it four times a day, they will be dying of all the symptoms, that this will create all the symptoms of a dying AIDS patient wasting away, losing weight, because it stopped the growing cells all over the body, stopped DNA replication. AZT was a failed chemotherapy drug left over from the 60s that had no use, sitting around with no patent, because it was short-term toxic. So 30,000 a year in this country, between 87 and 97, about 30,000 people a year, sick people from, uh, you know, they had pneumonia, tuberculosis, uh, common colds, the flu. If you came from a category 
of minority citizens of one kind or the other, they gave you the bogus HIV test. The HIV test comes with an insert in the package, a legal disclaimer that says the test does not test for or react to the HIV virus in any shape or form. It says HIV test kit on the box, but if you get the idea you're positive by using that test, you can't sue them for fraud because the disclaimer is right there. So this is not an HIV test. This is a particle test. It reacts to particles in your bloodstream that your immune system produces when you are sick from anything. The Australians and others have been saying for over 20 years that the HIV tests are a better test for pregnancy than the home pregnancy test to get a Juul and Dominix. Pregnancy is one of the things, along with <coughs> tuberculosis, common cold, flu, bacterial infections, so there's a, they've identified 108 ordinary illnesses so far that will produce particles in your bloodstream when you're sick that will react to that bogus test. So, spreading the knowledge that there is no AIDS epidemic and that a lot of sick people dying from medical malpractice can go a long way toward shutting down the for-profit pharmaceutical industry that sees an opportunity with the billionaires to make a bunch of money off of sick people. You know, AIDS is just, AIDS now, the AIDS epidemic is considered the most uh, successful criminal hoax in the medical community that's ever been promoted by, into the human race anywhere. Is, is this true for cancer? Uh, cancer is something else, but there's growing, emerging, uh, there's a lot of uh, emerging evidence showing that uh, doctors for 30 years have been claiming and, and having lists of patients they cured various kinds of cancers, but from what I hear, if a doctor hangs out a shingle and starts advertising that he can cure people, the FDA and the FBI will go right after them and shut down the practice and burn their files. And sometimes they get prosecuted and sent to prison uh, for you know, practicing medicine without a license or all kinds of fraud. So you know the cancer industry is multi-billion dollar, multi-hundred billion dollar. They just extract money from people and that industry would not exist if we had universal health care. If, if the interest was in keeping people well rather than making profits off the of sick people. So uh, the, the fundamental idea that you make profits off sick people is what's driving a lot of these uh, medical malpractice things. Okay, so in conclusion, <coughs> what I said was, and Project Censor and the others have been talking about this for 30 years, if these issues are covered and the public finds out in time to take corrective action, like they are in modern countries all over the world, we can move very fast toward having universal health care, universal education. Incidentally, Bernie Sanders the other day, I don't know if you've seen it on YouTube or the videos, Donald Trump had a meeting with uh, one of the high-ranking people from the Australian government, and he was praising the Australian health care system, saying it's way better than the American health care system. When, and Bernie says, says, thank you very much, Mr. Trump. Australia has universal health care, the one we're talking about. <laughs> you know, the cat is out of the bag, and you know, the elephant in the room is being talked about now. America stands, America stands number one in the eye. We're number one in several things. We're number one in military expenditure 20 times per person what any other country spends. We're number one and spending an enormous amount of money per person on health care where 50 million people are totally uninsured. We're number one in a variety of things that could change once the public finds out what's really going on. And that's why on the back of this list, on the back of this uh, flyer that I gave you tonight, there are just two references that are linked to hundreds of other websites. One of them, the first one, my favorite, and the favorite of Bill Moyers from Channel 11 and a bunch of other people, is called Common Dreams. That's a daily news site that posts the best of the best of what we call progressive common sense news. Uh, the best of the best comes up every day on Common Dreams, and a lot of these articles go viral to hundreds of other sites. Another site that has uh, veteran writers that have written a lot of these books I'm talking about, veteran writers also post uh, political articles and commentary commentary on a site called the Smirking Chimp. And that the Smirking Chimp has a picture of half of it is George Bush's face and half of it is a monkey's face. The Smirking <laughs> Chimp was founded the day after George Bush was installed in the White They're House. They're starting to run out of money though. They're doing a big donation. Uh, uh, a lot of sites are uh, they're supported 
by uh, viewers. And the problem some of these sites have funding themselves is that there's so many of them now that viewers have a choice. Viewers can't contribute money to 50 different sites every month. That's why some of them have more reliable, uh, more uh, you know, reliable readership than others. But in any case, you know, beneficial knowledge helps people learn. Uh, one, once you, as I said, um, on the portal websites, once you log on to one a site for an hour and begin to read, as Professor Griffin said, it's like walking through a doorway into stepping off a space shuttle onto a planet that has two suns and three moons. You're not in Kansas anymore. And once you see that 9-11 was a total myth, an inside job, you can't go back to where you believe we were attacked by 19 crazed Muslims. Uh, many people have made the comment that if we wanted to take over the oil fields, uh, rich oil fields off of Norway and north of there and take over their drilling rights, we would have been attacked by 19 crazed Norwegians on 9-11. If we wanted to take over the resources of Spain and invade that country with our military, we would have been attacked by 19 crazed Spaniards. That's what a false flag is. You kill a bunch of your own people in broad daylight and you blame it on country you want to invade. Nine, and that's what the uh, 2011 edition, anyway, the, the, the 2011 edition of uh, Censored News had, uh, the 2011 edition of this book, Censored News, has uh, several chapters on the updated forensic evidence. They covered it between 2006 and 2011. For five years that book was loaded with uh, you know articles about solving the questions people have, like questions people have from the audience tonight, they've been solved since 2006. And in 2011, basically, they stopped writing about it because they said the, the answer is known now. There, there's no reason to keep beating a dead horse. Uh, the investigation is moving forward. Uh, many sites are publishing the list. There's a book called uh, Nine, Another 19, 19 People in the Bush Administration that Orchestrated 9-11. Okay, um, that's, that concludes the presentation, so let's uh, open it to questions and answers. All right. I'd like to get, I'm sorry, I'd like to get your opinion of Helen Caldecott and Amory Lovins. Okay, uh, Tim has asked, the first question is, what is my opinion about Helen Caldecott and Amory Lovins? Well, you don't have to really follow my opinion so much as the published database of uh, credible articles. Helen Caldicott is almost like um, the ethical figure of, of Mother Teresa and Albert Einstein rolled into one. She has unimpeachable credentials. She's been fighting uh, for the freedom and justice of people to avoid being poisoned by radioactive pollutions in the environment. And she got started uh, in, with, with uh, physicians, I believe it was Physicians for Social Responsibility. If she wasn't a member, she was right there with them in 1983 when we formed the Northwest Information Service to educate people about the hazards of the nuclear fuel cycle and how nuclear power and nuclear weapons, the two industries, were linked. Helen Caldicott is one of the most respected, principal in, uh, nuclear experts on the planet. She has basically the credibility of, of Albert Einstein and 500 of his friends saying the earth isn't flat. Oh. Amory Lovins has the highest level of credibility in the world on teaching energy efficiency knowledge at all levels. Amory Lovins has been teaching since 1976 when he published an article <coughs> called uh, the Taking the Soft Energy Path. The soft energy path is using energy more efficiently rather than building more nuclear power plants to run our current sucking appliances. And back in when he uh, formed, uh, they built a house in 1984 up in the mountains of Colorado. There's a 3,000 square foot house that was built with the latest in energy efficient technology across the board. That 3,000 square foot house up in the mountains is a teaching center and uh, you can go there, they take, uh, what do you call it, tours through it. it. It's a public display educational center of what common sense building materials look like if they're used properly. The furnace, a need for a furnace in that house was replaced with thicker walls and more insulation in the windows and, and window glass 
that doesn't lose heat. The house has no heating bill and a five dollar a month electric bill. Well, that was 1984. Okay. Today, Another. the house gets a check back from the local utility for the excess electricity it produces on the roof. How come I've discovered that a lot of debunking about the uh, so-called facts that Helen Caldecott's come up with? The more I research, the more I find that she and Avery Lovins are more debunked than uh, anything yeah. else. Citing sources like you do, saying that you have the certainty of 9-11 in there. The more I'm researching these things, the more I'm becoming about to believe that uh, the thorium nuclear power is more effective than anything she said. She's lied about Chernobyl. She's lied about Fukushima. She's lied about some of the other things that radioactive waste is all about. Now, you understand, I'll show you that my sources too on this. Yeah, Tim, Tim, uh, Tim has brought up a good question. Tim has said, how come uh, you know, a lot of sites are debunking what Helen Collicott has told us? Uh, or they're debunking what Amory Loving said, or they're debunking what she has said about Fukushima. Uh, Helen Collicott has been telling the truth about the disaster of Fukushima, and the only way to combat the spread of that and slow down the spread of nuclear power is to have websites that look very professional and they, they put out basically bald-faced lies. Tim has just given us, given us a summary. I don't think so, lies. Andy. Yeah, Tim, it is. You, you have, well, to, you have I'll, to stand I'll, back and look. I've looked uh, and I'm seeing it, but I'm just Give saying, me a list of those sites. I'll, I'll show write you. Write it down for me and I okay. will research it for you. Yeah. But there are sites all over the internet that are trying to say we're debunking what these scientists are saying and they are right out of the playbook called Merchants of Doubt. Create doubt to slow down the spread of the body of fact. Charlie, next okay. question. Yeah, you appear to be against censorship, but you showed that book by Judy Woods. And if anybody puts anything up on the internet critical of that book, she sues them for copyright infringement. And you can't put any any uh, videos or anything up against her book. And why are you on one side? You're against censorship. But she's a, she's a notorious censor. Uh, people have to defend copyright rights. When a book is copyrighted, copyrights are for a reason. Yeah. Um, you know, we have copyright laws in this country, so you just can't take pictures and whole sections out of a book and run it in an article as somebody else's work. You know, that's part of the problem. And, and Judy, the reason they are attacking that textbook I don't know if people know this. YouTube, rather than get into litigation, takes the videos down. Right. So she claims it's a it's a copyright infringement, and they take the video down. There still are videos critical of that book because they're produced in another fashion. They, uh, the reason, you know, what we're talking about here tonight, and what Project Censor oh, yeah, talks maybe. about, is how credible sources in this country once. Once somebody begins to publish critical evidence that cuts into the profits of billionaires or cuts into the mainstream view, they begin to get attacked from all levels. And you have to sort through, you know, the internet is full of these sites that have false information and are attacking credible sources. And once, you know, you see that uh, there's only a handful of sites that are publishing information saying cigarette smoking is not harmful to your health. You know, there's thousands of places where you can find out that the medical evidence of doctors and people doing surgery and everything else, the, the evidence on cigarette smoking has been very solid for We're 20, 25, 30 years. Woman. It's not debatable. We're and talking about this woman. That's what I'm You're talking about. She's engaging Charlie, in censorship. don't scream and yell at me. I'm talking about how she is engaging in censorship. <laughs> What's the name of the she book? Made, the, the name of the book is Where Did the Towers Go? And when, when somebody publishes things that are slanderous, you have to defend yourself. And that's all she's doing. She doesn't make any claims about who did 9-11. She says she makes no claims about who did it. Her book is about the forensic evidence about what happened on 9-11. Which buildings were leveled and turned to dust. There's all kinds of pictures in there about the forensic evidence. And when you start with that, then you have to start looking around at who did 9-11 and it wasn't praise Muslims. Next question right here. Um, is is the, uh, the dictator from uh, North Korea, is this a, a credible threat or is it something being built up so we spend more money on the military or what, what do you know about it? 
uh, right now in the military, we're, we appear to be getting a lot of junk food news stories, yeah, pro and con and everything else coming out of North Korea. Um, they do this, uh, you know, North Korea may be on the road to getting a, you know, a nuclear weapon and letting the world know they have one, just because if you're a country that has nuclear weapons, you're not likely to be attacked by the state of Israel with their nukes or the United States. The United States, if you notice, never attacks any country that has a possible portable weapons where they can level one of our cities and so So uh, for a nuke, having a one or two nukes is considered a deterrence for having your country turned into a Stone Age parking lot like what we did to Iraq what we've done to Afghanistan, bombing those countries back to the Stone Age. Iraq has been considered, for those of you that didn't know it, Iraq has been considered uninhabitable for humans since 2005 because so much depleted uranium dust has been spread over that land that living and breathing the air in Iraq is like living downwind from the cloud of Chernobyl. And uh, there's Iraqi hospitals are reporting that women basically can no longer have healthy, non-genetically damaged children in Iraq. So if you live in Iraq on the ground, as a woman, you can basically uh, forget about having healthy children because of the radioactive dust contamination. Over here? Question? Yes, question? Um, I'd like to know what part maybe chemtrails and harp play on our extreme weather that we're having. <laughs> Uh, you know, here's a question that wasn't on tonight's agenda at all, oh, is what sorry. to do about uh, chemtrails. Uh, and that's that's a whole other subject that Ted Aranda has talked about. He has, uh, I have not researched <coughs> the subject of chemtrails other than seeing a handful of articles showing that uh, that's a radioactive subject. If, if you're a reporter, if you try to write about chemtrails or you talk about it on television, you get instantly fired and blackballed. Your career is over. The, uh, if you're a mechanic out at the airport and you ask uh, your crew chief uh, you're on the ground, the mechanical, you say, "What are these tanks for?" Uh, you know, with the little sprayers on the wings of some of United and Delta jets that are used for spraying the chemtrails. Commercial airliners. Your job is suspended. Uh, you have to have the union fight to get your job back if you swear that you never saw or heard anything. That subject is totally radioactive, and there's very, uh, I, I don't know, because I haven't researched it, I don't know where the websites are where you can find out what they're spraying into the atmosphere. But the same thing with HARP, uh, the, the high altitude uh, weather you know, modification program. They are uh, trying to modify the weather in certain places. There's all kinds of controversy on that pro and con too, because of uh, the, the hard, the difficult program, a uh, difficult possibility and effort of getting credible knowledge. It's a radioactive subject. And so you know, initially, like I said, initially the, the people that started uh, investigating the anthrax mainly in 2001, they started dying mysterious deaths. Several dozen people were murdered. Uh, in the few months following 9-11 that had biological knowledge of uh, the anthrax mailings. And so, but it takes years for these things, sometimes 20, 30, 40 years. After the fact, in the press, it's called, it's called news by delay. The press will, and one guy said it's like covering out, coming out in the, the, the battlefield after battle over is shooting the wounded. Uh, they report something years later after the damage is already done and there's no way to deal with it in real time. Okay, you got a question here? Yeah, the, uh, the uh, four planes that hit the, in 9-11, they were loaded with kerosene, and when they hit the, the, the building, the kerosene melted the girders, and that caused it to, to fall. And you, you say it's a blip. The other thing I was talking about the Republicans, you're talking about pedophiles and sexual perverts. A psychiatrist, if he was here, he would say, people who make accusations like that, that's in your mind. I don't see the Republicans as perverts or pedophiles. That's what you think. Okay, uh, the, the gentleman here has just given us a, a, a clear, we've just gotten a clear example in the compression set, uh, his question saying that it's my opinion, it's my opinion that there are some Republican pedophiles some. that have been prosecuted. Yeah. 
It's not, and, and that's not my opinion. That's documented police records for number one. Number two, it's documented by scientists, hundred thousands of scientists and pilots for 9-11 Truth and architects have documented the fact that burning kerosene jet fuel does not get anywhere near hot enough to melt steel girders. That the idea, the very idea that the jet fuel melted the steel has been considered uh, one of the most popular corrosive pieces of mythology that's ever been produced. The people, the people that uh, produced the Twin Tower, built it, the company that produced the steel, they were on the phone in the afternoon of 9-11 said, why are you telling us that the steel melted? Everybody knows that you make barbecue grills, you make stoves, you make pot belly stoves. Uh, if you don't want it to burn in a hydrocarbon fire, you make it out of steel. So the people that continue to give us the idea that the steel melted and poof, the buildings just collapsed, they are continuing to promote the myth that was sold to us by the media. And so uh, the, the problem is not that I'm, pro I'm, I'm promoting an opinion. The problem is how to gently get somebody to step through the psychological barrier and look at the evidence and quit maintaining themselves in fantasy land believing the official hoax. That's why I give these speeches. We give people a present. Uh, we give people the opportunity to look at simple references that are all over the place, easy to understand, if you want to open your mind 30% and use your seventh grade educational science ability to understand it. Okay? Question over here. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I keep reading in the alt-right uh, websites that um, approximately 3,500 uh, people have been arrested because they're pedophiles and that uh, the Trump administration is building, you know, kind of a base to take it all the way up. Um, and again, kind of referencing what you were saying, that, uh, you know, whether it's the CIA or the Mossad, that for a long time they have gotten people into sexually compromised situations. And then, you know, they, whether they have videotapes or whatever, uh, they can then blackmail people quite effectively. Uh, what's your thought on that process going on right now? Uh, the gentleman simply asked a question. Uh, uh, what's my thoughts on uh, groups of people, the CIA or the Israeli Mossad or other intelligence agencies that want to influence our government, uh, having videotapes of some of our politicians involved in uh, sex uh, pedophile uh, rings and stuff like that. Well, his, his question has been documented as being true in a bunch of different sources. Uh, it's, it's, that's how I said, it's one of the, the Franklin scandal is one of the most radioactive subjects you can talk about because it's a game changer. Like if you go into a Catholic church on Sunday and say, oh, by the way, Father O'Malley has been abusing your kids for 12 years, Half the people say, get out of here, or that can't be true. I'm not going to look at the evidence. The other half says, if a shred of this is true, this is a game changer, and Father O'Malley is gone. And this is what you can say about the politicians. Somebody, somebody produces a videotape showing a politician having sex with an 11 or 12-year-old boy or girl. That politician's career is over. So the people that own these tapes tell the politicians, hey, I want you to vote for this bill. I want you to vote for this bill that will shovel a few billion dollars in tax breaks to our, our company. This is how the blackmail ring works in the United States. Would you tell us that report again, Andy, please? What? The report that you're citing on this? Uh, the reports, well, I, uh, it started, uh, the reports evolved out of the Franklin cover-up and the Franklin scandal in uh, about 1990. And uh, you can just Google uh, research on the Franklin scandal, and you'll see other subjects that have gone forward. You'll get a bunch of hits on, uh, you know, pedophile sex abuse uh, in, in American politicians. But it's, it's not something, I haven't seen an article lately in, in, uh, in the, the, the censored news edition. There are some subjects that they're not covering either because they're so actively radioactive. 
okay? And so, uh, like Amy Goodman on uh, Amy Goodman on uh, Democracy Now! will talk about all kinds of crimes going on around the world and crimes against humanity and everything else. But Amy will absolutely never mention 9-11. If anybody asks her a question about 9-11 when she's in a public place, She'll run the other way and duck into a restroom or something. She won't acknowledge even the question. So uh, we don't know. We suspect that the lives of these people have been threatened. The people that are in the media, uh, the progressive media, 9-11 is one thing that most of them uh, won't go anywhere near uh, because it's a radioactive subject and it's a game changer. Once people learn that 9-11 was an inside job, that, we, that this was done by a coalition of Americans, <laughs> traitors in high places, it changes your outlook on the American government, and then you can't go back. Oh, you, you had an update? Well, just uh, what I was trying to bring out, which you addressed mostly, was if you have, uh, let's say, I'm just going to say the Trump administration and some of those individuals, Deciding that they want to go after, you know, because uh, Bill Clinton, for example, uh, is mentioned as somebody who's been out to, you know, Jeffrey Epstein's island, etc. And so, you know, you have that dynamic. Donald Trump and some individuals, maybe other individuals in the intelligence community, going after the pedophiles. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that's a huge leverage for people who want to have politicians and others under control. So that's what your question is. Well, the question is, where do you think that's going to end up? Oh, the question, I, I don't, where, where do I think the investigation? Uh, I think the knowledge about the pedophiles will become public light when the public reaches critical mass like they did with the church pedophile program. The church was able to cover it up for years, decades, moving these pedophile priests around because the church was able to successfully black out and bribe newspapers and everywhere else. They, they bribed them so that their editors, they, they would not investigate until the Boston Globe investigated in 2001, that spotlight story. And then they had honest investigative reporters. That was before the Koch brothers and the others started buying up and owning the media. Today, uh, billionaires with a lot of billions own all of our major media and they can control the employment's records and uh, the ability of reporters to make a living. So uh, this is one of the reasons why the pedophile program he's talking about, in a black you know, if you look, as Jim Hightower wrote a book called Thieves in High Places in 20, 2003, and he said, look at this list. Uh, you, in order to pass legislation like this, you need people that uh, basically are being blackmailed. That's the only reason they would vote for things that are so destructive to the environment, their constituents, uh, the Constitution, uh, rights. The, the, uh, most of these people voting for this destruction are in the Republican Party because the Republican Party has been taken over by people who can or are being uh, blackmailed either with huge money, they're making enormous amount of profits uh, by voting a certain way, or if money isn't a motivated, motivation enough for them, they're being blackmailed. And so that's where we are today. Uh, another, another, who else had a question here? We're getting ready. Uh, Dennis. Okay, Andy, always uh, appreciate your presentations and thanks. I didn't mention this when I was here two weeks ago on Earth Day. I participated that day in the March for Science Chicago, and that's just one of the demonstrations around the country on Earth Day. Now, we're all alive today because of science. I don't think anybody's going to argue about that. And you mentioned The Merchants of Doubt, which is an excellent book that both of us have talked about here at the college. Now, could you go into some more detail about what's happened to science, what's happening to science nowadays in the days of the Trump administration and the Republican-controlled Congress and their corporate backers? Uh, Dennis' question is, what's happened to science? Well, there, since Trump hit the Oval Office, there is a coordinated, all-out effort. There's a war on the concept of science and scientific thought in this country, where they're calling it fake news and everything else. Uh, as I said, the tobacco strategy laid out in 1969 was, when there's no longer any way to combat the body of fact, 
then you begin to attack the scientists themselves. You slander them, like Tim talked about, uh, Helen Caldicott and Amory Lovins, two of the most respected people on the planet, are being slandered uh, and attacked as, as, as having uh, less than closer. qualified credentials. They're the being closer. What? Oh, sorry. They're being slandered and attacked by people that are paid, you know, paid trolls and others, by the billionaires that want to create doubt. After the, I would, everybody should get their own copy of this book and digest it from start to finish. Merchants of Doubt, because it will explain a lot of the questions you have about what's happening in our country. On every single issue where the scientific evidence is so overwhelming that it's undebatable, then you have people that are creating doubt and attacking the scientists that published the material. So there, it's no surprise that there's an all-out war on science, science at all levels in the country, because if people came to know how big the database of unassailable evidence is, it's a game changer. People, people's view, like when people live near a toxic waste dump and they find out that they're kids, uh, the reason they're getting cancer and leukemia is because of all kinds of pollution in the water from fracking and stuff. It changes their view of that company that's doing the fracking. It's no longer a safe energy source. It's a toxic waste problem. Charlie? Yeah, there's all kinds of books, uh, theories about 9-11, but I want to read a book, a tell-all book, that says I was one of the conspirators' participants. And I blew up the Twin Towers, or Deathbed Confession Book. Can you give me the name of an author who participated like that? I blew up the Twin Towers. Uh, I believe that information is in a book called Another 19, where they're, they've named 19 people from the Bush administration. Did they write a book? Uh, no, uh, uh, an author that interviewed them did. The book, accused, wasn't, the book was not written by any one of the 19 None of the accused particular. has had a tell-all book. No. Uh, not one Char person. Uh, let me answer your question, Charlie. Where, where would we be if evidence of a serial killer in a city was being brought to the police? And every time a dead body was brought in with the same symptoms, a girl was murdered by a slasher or something, or a child was murdered, you had 16 dead bodies over a period of about eight months, and each time another body was brought into the police, the police said, until that child, until that serial killer comes in here and said, I did it, we're not going to investigate. We won't look back. We, in, or, in order to prosecute this case, we need the killer to come in here and say he did it. We're not going to look at any circumstantial evidence. We're not going to look at the dead bodies. We need the killer to come in and say he did it. Otherwise, we can't have an investigation. Do you have any that, sign? Do you have a signed confession? You don't, well, the police, the police never get a signed confession when Not even one? Until they investigate. These people head for the hills, and until somebody investigates, people that commit crimes and murders don't just come in and say, I did it. That's not how the system works, ever. So, Charlie, I would say, adopt, try to adopt the 30 over 7, Charlie. Open your mind 30%. And step through the cycle because I know person. you graduated from seventh grade. Do you have a first person narrative of 9 11 by anyone? Uh, yes, there are some suspected ones uh, that are in Israel. They've, they've gotten, uh, there are some testimony of people uh, that have dual Israeli American passports that helped pack the explosives and prep the Twin Towers. It was a dual Israeli-American event. The Israeli Mossad helped our CIA to uh, uh, promote the whole story. Uh, Pat. Yes. Uh, is there any proof for this, or is this merely Thanks. allegations uh, that, uh, you know, somebody pipe dream, or is there something solid here? There, uh, Pat asked, is there any proof for this? As uh, Pat got here late, as I was describing uh, at the start, this is what, I, uh, what we just said about 9-11 is not some unsubstantiated opinion. It's a summary of a database where these forensic facts have been proven and published by different sources from different angles. Uh, what I, uh, in answer to Pat's specific question, after he gets through talking to Heather, in answer to Pat's specific question that he just asked now, is there any proof, I would encourage you to log on to a site. Pat, Pat, are you listening? 
Hello, Pat. Pat. Andy's talking. Okay. Andy's talking to you. You asked me a question just now. Yes, and I was answering it. Uh, okay. Are, are you guys through? Uh, I, I can take 30 seconds. Okay. We are it out. What's the site, Andy? The site that Pat was talking about, it will answer Pat's question. Uh, one of the very best sites is called Military Officers, Military Intelligence Officers for 9-11 Truth. And in there you will find captains, generals, people retired from the CIA, people retired from NSA, people retired from military intelligence, hundreds of them in that one site showing the forensic evidence. But were they participants? The people that are investigating were not participants, Charlie. They are naming the people who did participate. And there's an uh, if you Google, there's a Google uh, site. Just Google a site called, uh, you know, the subject. Israel did 9-11. And you'll find out the connection with all the dual Israeli-American citizens who were put in high key positions of the Bush administration for the first nine months. A lot of those people resigned their posts right after 9-11 happened. But they were placed in positions to control the media and everything else. Also, they were in position to control the media and the cover-up after 9-11 happened. You have to promote the event, and you also have to be able to control the public. You know, if, as I said, Pat, it's a 30 over 7. You need a 30% open mind and a 7th grade education to understand the massive amount of forensic evidence that's been documented and published. This is not one person's opinion. It's, it's ten thousands of years of investigative reports done by tens of thousands of people all over the world. It's a huge database, like it is on asbestos and cigarettes. Over here. Uh, there's no question that Cheney and Halliburton took advantage of 9-11 and made huge Wall Street profits and got us in all these wars. Go on and on, disabled the, 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 the uh, Middle East now. And, it's been a cluster for decades now. But these big American, these companies, American Airlines, United Airlines, these airports, I mean, these question. are big ass. What's your question, please? Question. Question. Where's, okay, these people have these assets, these airplanes cost, I think, $100 million each. Wouldn't they know if that was a false airplane? Or wouldn't they know that um, that airplane was not accounted for? There's hundreds okay. of people know okay, about this airplane. I can answer your question right now. Wouldn't I'll they know that? I'll answer your question right now, and I don't want you to ever ask me this question again, ever. Log on to a site, log on to a site called Pilots for 9-11 Truth. Pilots for 9-11 Truth will publish the evidence of the four tail numbers of where those planes were and where they went and where they were on duty after 9-11. The, 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 the physicists for 9-11 in 2005, they said the evidence of 9-11 involved controlled demolition and aircraft substitution, okay? Log on to Pilots for 9-11 Truth and Physicists for 9-11 Truth and read for a couple weeks and don't ask that question again uh, because I've been answering it for years. And we, we take up, we allow people to take up the time when we could be moving forward, oh, getting more, more positive. Uh, we're, we're going to go to, uh, it's, it's almost 8 o'clock. Okay, uh, who wants, uh, one last question over here, and, and then we'll, we'll go to rebuttals. A little bit late. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I'm impressed with um, all the work you've done, all the reading you've done. It really is very impressive. My question is, what would you have to read or see to change your opinion on 9-11? My opinion on 9-11? Yeah, what you've presented on 9-11, what would you have to read or see to change your opinion? Uh, I have to read um, any credible book or information by a credible scientist anywhere who is publishing evidence showing that the laws of physics, gravity, chemistry, the basic laws that we work with as scientific labs, that none of those basic uh, laws applied to anything that happened on 9-11. That's what you would need because, as I said, there's hundreds of thousands of people collectively in all the groups, the scientific groups all over the planet, not just in our country, they're publishing the forensic evidence. 
They, and, a, and a child can understand it. Seven buildings were eliminated. They filmed the first two and sold it as an attack by crazed Muslims. They didn't film. They didn't show us the other five buildings that were demolished that day. The whole center was demolished. It was a huge real estate fraud scam. He took out terrorist insurance in, the, in July, right after they got control of the lease on all the buildings. They took out massive billions of dollars worth of terrorist insurance. So they defrauded the insurance companies, and they didn't have to pay for the demolition of the buildings. They didn't get sued for asbestos dust all over the world in Manhattan. They made billions in the process. It was one giant successful real estate fraud. Okay, let's uh, have a show of hands about who wants to do a rebuttal now. Okay. One, one last question in the back, and then we'll start the rebuttals quickly. Yeah, you touched on the election. Uh, uh, what are your, what's your, your group in the sense of going to come out with something about the possibility of uh, the election uh, being defrauded by hacking? Okay, uh, Greg Palast, his palace, Greg Palast, I think it's gregpalast.com, right. has uh, tons of stuff on election fraud and the, where was it? This new book you can get at Barnes and Noble, Censored 2017, has a chapter in here about the election fraud that happened last year. They, 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 there was two types of election fraud in this country. One of them was in the Democratic Party. The media made a the media made a deal with Hillary Clinton. The media said, if you give us certain beneficial things after you get in office and get control of the White House, we will bury Bernie Sanders for you. When he is winning primaries and, and, and getting more votes than Hillary all over the country, we, the media, will report Bernie is losing, which is what they did. Bernie Sanders beat Hillary Clinton soundly all across this country in the primaries, and the media reported Bernie as losing. And then they coronated Hillary, and this is one of the reasons that Hillary lost the main election. People, progressive Democrats that were learning what was happening, were totally disgusted that the one choice among 60, 70 percent of the American people was Bernie Sanders. And they completely eliminated him and gave us the toxic campaign of Hillary. Then after, after Bernie was eliminated, then the media began to eliminate Hillary to install Trump, who would be the puppet. He would be a total puppet of the billionaires that want to run our country for eight years like they did with the two, the two puppets of Cheney and Bush. So Trump, Trump can be expected to give us another four or eight years of Bush Cheney crimes. That's that's it. Okay, let's go to rebuttals now, please. Okay. Uh, we have a show of hands. Have a show of hands. And those of you, incidentally, that haven't paid your uh, three dollar tuition fee tonight, good. could you get your tuition ready, and I'll come around during the rebuttals up here. Thank you. Okay, how long are the rebuttals? Uh, Probably about three minutes each. Or less. Well, how, how many people want to give a rebuttal? Are there uh, six or eight? Or no. One, two, three. That's four. We'll go to four five, minutes. Six, seven. We can go to four minutes. Go to four minutes and we'll have a quick uh, summary. Just give one uh, okay, I, I, summary. Just go to four minutes for rebuttals each and let's get started. If you're ready, let's go. And okay. Any Sean Spicer, anybody? What? You put your mouth closer to it. I don't know if it's turned on. It's turned on. I just I think we're starting to run low on batteries. Testing, one, two, three. He can't hear us. Thank you. Testing. Thank you. Turn it up a little bit. Yeah. No, we need to turn it up. To Can you move it closer yeah. to your mouth? Mm -hmm. Where is the uh, testing? One, two, three. It's uh, right now. It's broke, Charlie. I got to get another one. Testing. One, two, three. Hello. You just have to talk really loud and try talking. Okay. We can generally hear you if you talk fairly loud. Okay. All right. Well, it's no question that the um, media in this country, especially the television media, is a joke. I turn on the nightly news, there's one major story, there's 10 happy stories, and about, about 20 ads for, for drugs and pharmaceuticals. So what happened now with the media is that I checked the Pew Research and People under 50, most of those people get their information from Facebook and news. 
testing one, two, three. It's coming out, but it's like I said, we're starting to lose power to the transmitter. Want me I mean, to go down the Dollar Tree? No, we'll be all right. We got enough left if you just speak loud. So, you know, people under 50 get most of their information from um, Facebook, and of course the Russians and the right wing nut jobs knew that, so they put out a lot of put out a lot of fake news on Facebook uh, during the election season. And then people over 50 still depend on, unfortunately, nut job right wing radio and all their fake news. And then also then the commercialized, edited garbage nightly news on television, which you can't trust. So, um, uh, you know, uh, good news needs to get out there. Andy, you're correct. And Andy, you've got to have a Facebook page. You talk about national and global and international issues. I, I want to see the Northwest Information Bureau on Facebook so that you can defend uh, some principles, except for 9-11. Oh. Worthless. Huh? Facebook is worthless. Yeah, Charlie's all over Facebook. It's worth it. But it's anybody. Can, you, you believe nightly news. You're any, full of baloney. Any idiot can put them whatever they want on Facebook. Right. The least you know what? Facebook got Trump elected, What's okay? The area for truth? Uh, here, I'm going to say it one more time. Facebook got Trump elected. Okay, the Russians have it. Right there is nothing that's oh. Go ahead, watch your nightly news in your pharmaceutical commercial. I do not have a Facebook. Yeah, you're right. right. You're right. You're right. Facebook elected Facebook and two parties took it over. The legitimate um, media is So I, I just want to thank uh, Andy for the presentation. I thought that. Uh, you know, he goes over a lot of things which, if they are true, uh, would be very, very disturbing. And I think there's a lot of truth here. Uh, but I want to uh, talk about a couple of things connected to this. One is, I remember when I was getting trained some years ago in a uh, week-long workshop on uh, giving treatment to sex offenders. One of the things that was emphasized was the difference between a sociopath and a psychopath. And uh, the difference that was explained was uh, that a psychopath has no loyalty to anyone other than himself or herself. And you can expect the psychopath sooner or later to create problems that will result in their removal or they will be penalized in some kind of a way, generally speaking. The sociopath has no loyalty to anybody but a very small group, like their family, perhaps uh, in organized crime. You have some sociopaths who actually will have loyalty right to the end uh, to the other people who are part of the group. You also have some psychopaths in there who get weeded out uh, pretty easily. And if you look at what's going on uh, at, at this point in time with Donald Trump, you know, when he was running for president, he had two messages which kind of crossed over somewhat with Bernie Sanders. One was the outsourcing of the jobs and how that had kind of impoverished the you know, blue-collar working class in the United States, and, and some other people, too. And the other one was Donald Trump said, uh, I'm not going to create more wars in the Middle East. I want to have some sort of detente with Russia. we got to save money. We can't keep making these foolish decisions. Now that overlapped to some degree with Bernie Sanders, particularly the economic message. And I think that that actually had some impact on the electorate, despite all other things. But if you look at what's happening right now, Donald Trump is essentially rejecting very, very quickly uh, most of the people 
and the policy positions that he ran on. And there's always reasons for it. You know, the uh, Michael Flynn, okay, Michael Flynn is gone. Good reasons or bad reasons. Then Steve Bannon, he's gone. No problem for Trump at all. Uh, he seems to have a pretty uh, uh, good ability to make moves that uh, protect himself and his family. And ultimately, it looks like having gotten into office, he's concluding that the way to go is, I mean, I got to say, uh, despite all his criticism of Hillary Clinton over long periods of time, certainly in foreign policy, he's pretty much moving in the same direction. And I suspect when it comes to economic realities, it's going to be the same kind of thing. You can kind of see it getting set up. And I do think that, yeah, uh, you know, anyway, I just want to point out that uh, I do think at this point in time you're going to see a lot of sociopathic, if not psychopathic, moves from the current president. Something to watch. Thank you. Uh, again, um, like um, has been expressed, I want to thank um, Andy for bringing these topics up. It's always interesting. Uh, the problem is there's so many of them, and uh, I think if we could focus on uh, just a few instead of being scattershot all over the place. There's so many evils. There's so many battles to fight, um, and um, we need to um, uh, focus on those that are relevant. Uh, uh, I think that delving, com com completely going back and delving and, and relitigating everything um, about 9-11 is maybe um, not useful anymore um, because uh, that, was, that was the Bush and Cheney regime. We all know they were evil. We can, you know, go back and forth about that. Iraq, you know, uh, the invasion of Iraq, uh, the job and all of that stuff. Um, we really have a serious threat here and uh, it is the threat of uh, a bona fide, leaning type of fascist person in the White House. The one that's a sociopath, and then we have the one in the wings, in case he's impeached, who just tries to act like he is a uh, statesman. He will be, he possibly could be the white knight that would take over uh, if Donald Trump is removed. So we have these, this two-headed snake, which is extremely dangerous, and we need to focus on the ills um, of the current day. Uh, I'm glad he brought up about the health care thing, but he, he didn't uh, stress enough this uh, health bill, that they, uh, this decimation of, uh, of uh, the ACA, that they are, uh, this travesty of a thing that they recently uh, uh, passed. Now, some people have different opinions. I mean, some say that, well, that's good. I mean, why don't they just go ahead and, you know, wipe out people's health care that have gotten used to it, that voted for Trump, and they'll see, you know, him for the snake he is and whatever. But um, we have to battle all of these uh, um, dangers that, uh, that this current regime um, is, uh, is focused on. Now, I, wa I don't want to forget to mention that uh, I was very disturbed uh, to hear Tim Bolger say something about that uh, protests should be suppressed. Now, look, now there were some uh, bills. One of them was in Arizona. Uh, they got beaten back, thank goodness, uh, but it actually did pass one of the uh, houses of, uh, uh, of the uh, Arizona legislature, which uh, would have actually uh, put in this awful uh, law that you can confiscate all the property of a protester if that protester was part of a protest where, who knows, some infiltrators came in and broke some windows, and so there was a, quote, riot. They could call it a riot, and, and they could come back at uh, the organizers of a protest who had nothing to do with those crimes, or even if they did have something to do with it, the crimes are so small, the crimes might be so in disproportionate to the idea of confiscating someone's house, but this would have a chilling effect on protests. So it is not a joke, and I don't know if Tim was bringing his uh, subject up as a joke or not, but if it was not a joke, especially shame on you, Tim, uh, it's a horrible thing for you to want to decimate the First Amendment that way. But this is a legitimate thing. That I, I never said... These people are fascists, and they would love to prevent protests from happening. Now, I participated in the March on Science and the uh, march uh, from Union uh, Park to um, downtown, um, and uh, I was very proud of that. 
and very thankful that at least in this city and in this state there is no immediate danger to the First Amendment on those scores, but uh, who knows what the regime uh, might propose in federal law or what could happen on a state level uh, to decimate our civil liberties. Thank you. Okay, I'm Shame on you. Google again. Google again. <laughs> Troublemakers. Hi, I'm Ellen Corley. Uh, this is my guess, third, fourth time speaking here. I love this forum and a free speech. I uh, really appreciated Andy's talk. I agree with him in every way, uh, mainly because I see the media and the the censorship, the control of the media by the state. Uh, I think it's the really the CIA, the people that were brought in. Alan Dulles, after World War II, brought in uh, Nazi war criminals who's, who were the same people that started that financed Hitler. The Bush's grandfather uh, was head of CIA. You know these. These are basically a secret police regime that we know uh, we know are behind using our state. They just it's hidden um, to in the same way the Nazis did. I, I'm reading a book by this Larouche Lyndon Larouche, where he I did, he knows. I mean, history is history. It happened, and the names have been named, and he documents Carl Schmidt was Hitler's jurist who influenced Leo Strauss, came over here at, to the University of Chicago and the, you know, it's, they created Paul Wolfowitz and all these neoliberals, neocons, they use the media, you know, this is all documented CIA plots to control the media by the state for fascist control uh, to implement you know, imperialism and uh, really uh, what he actually studied Hobbes and, you know, based his theory on that, you know, the people are stupid and the state has to control them. This is the opposite of democracy, the, as we know it, our John Locke, Rousseau, uh, Montesquieu, you know, we're talking about a government and a people. I've come to realize that even better is Marx and the, that, you know, he really is a great philosopher that we, that the fascist wanted to discredit by their war on, on communism and the Cold War. They used their elitism and their bully pulpit to, to slander and smear and make it seem that communism, you know, sharing, leaving the people alone is somehow, you know, that's fascism. It, it really is this opposite, you know, that's what you are. There, there, it's, it is an anti-science, really. They, they take the, uh, the, the good people and um, smear them. I know about this because my stepfather uh, was actually in the Manhattan Institute, which was started by William Casey, who started you know, the Ryan Contra, you know, so I've, and I've come actually experienced how my sister has become, and her son, uh, they are all kind of promoted to be senators, kind of like Gorsuch and the Federalist Society by these NGOs. They're, ma they're like Manchurian candidates, and they, she's been secretly lying about me so that I won't inherit anything. But you never know it because they, they they're like little Iagos. They are the definition of evil. And they actually are Satanists. They're, you know, Nazis and Satanism is exactly the cult philosophy that is behind these Machiavellians who, because of their cult-like, it's okay, everybody's doing it we're among ourselves. Um, look, we're getting rich. They, they, you know, it's hard to stand up to them. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Dennis Nelson. I'm with the Nuclear Energy Information Service, NEIS. I'm going to continue my nuclear free is better than nuclear thorium presentation from the Earth Day debate two weeks ago 
about Tim's favorite subject, and as you can see, it's not about the Chicago Cubs. And Andy, I'm sure that you're going to find something else to say about this topic. Key questions about energy policy have just as much, if not more, to do with frames, worldviews, and assumptions than about facts and data. Tim dismisses data, which challenges his nuclear thorium worldview, even if the information is reliable. The three high-powered technologists whose substantial analyses I included in my dynamite debate presentation two weeks ago, physicist and engineer Dr. Arjun Makajani, carbon-free and nuclear-free, physicist and energy consultant Amory B. Lovins, reinventing fire, and civil and environmental engineer Dr. Mark C. Jacobson, Solutions Project, have each crunched the numbers and have independently concluded that nuclear power is unneeded when it comes to both climate denial and delay and renewable energy denial and delay we must follow the money look for clues that reveal entrenched ideologies of the fossil fuel and nuclear power industries and strip away the fiction from the Koch brothers and Exelon so that we better understand how context shapes truth to this day, pro-nuclear cheerleaders are still ch chasing the hype set forth in the 1950s of nuclear power becoming too cheap to meter. The Thorium Energy Alliance even goes so far as to call thorium, it, its preferred nuclear material, a so-called superfuel. This uh, pro-nuclear technological fantasy by the Thorium Energy Alliance is attempting to convince everyone else to endorse nuclear thorium technology with an almost religious fervor creating a nuclear thorium utopian vision about how grand our society will supposedly become once the liquid molten salt thorium reactor is adopted. Ooh, Costs are being underestimated and benefits are being overestimated. Pro-nuclear thorium enthusiasts continue to evaluate nuclear power in the future tense. This is in terms of what it will bring instead of what it has already brought. In short, the Thorium Energy Alliance is guilty of sweeping away my real current concerns about the nuclear power fiasco for illusionary gains promised in the future. Tim presented France as the so-called poster child for how to do nuclear. However, when you dig underneath the surface of the pro-nuclear hype, you discover the truth. The French nuclear program is really a bust. Now, Tim said that France is 90% nuclear dependent, and I don't know where Tim got that number. France has produced about 80% of its electricity with 58 nuclear reactors, but that's going to change. In, in 2015, the French National Assembly voted that only 50% of France's electricity would be generated by nuclear reactors by 2025. Of course, this is still 50% too much nuclear, yet it is still a good step in the right direction. Energy efficiency, cogeneration, and renewable energy technologies are France's best bets for replacing the electricity. This is from a summary of Pandora's false promises, busting the pro-nuclear propaganda, a report by Beyond Nuclear updated August 2013. Quote, myths about the French nuclear program abound. Only 4% of the country's high-level radioactive waste has been vitrified and stored. Given its 80% dependency on nuclear power, when droughts and heat waves force reactors to power down or close, France has no other options and is forced to import electricity. France has an enormous unsolved waste problem with no repository, a huge extra expense due to its misadventure with fast breeder reactors, and a radiological legacy from its 210 abandoned uranium mines which continue to pollute the environment today. Thanks a lot, and I'm, I'm glad everybody came. Everybody. You know, this is this is what I call craziness. You see, the problem is, is that Dennis did not, he knows the difference between nuclear reactors. I am going to agree with him that the light water reactor that we have right now is not the best way to do nuclear. I'm also going to agree with him that the very founder and one of the inventors of the light water reactor, Alvin Weinberg, had started to address these questions and was fired by a congressman in 1973. His, the guy's name was Alvin Weinberg and he, he wanted to solve the problem of the so-called light water reactor and he did it by running a reactor for over 6,000 hours in 1960 which was basically a molten salt reactor. 
The thing that makes these molten salt reactors so safe is that first of all they run at atmospheric pressure. They do not require this massive piping and plumbing problems that go in. Two, having a liquid fluoride thorium reactor mixes the fuel up a bunch better. 3% of fuel is only burned in a light water reactor. And of course these things are debacles because that's not the way to do nuclear. Alvin Weinberg, who invented the very molten salt thorium reactor, said that what we are doing now is not the best way to do nuclear. So I'm going to give him that credit. But what he doesn't tell you is that our electric demand, I've seen Avery Lovins reports, I've seen some of these things, and they're based on, on projections that are not going to be evolved. We heard we're going to want to cut back on power. We're going to want to cut back on things, but the problem is projections are saying that we're going to need five times as much power as we do now in less than 20 years. And the thing is, when you look at the, at the uh, amount of land, amount of materials, amount of resources that are going to take to do renewables all over the planet, it's absolutely crazy. Putting the entire state of Arizona under solar power to just to power our country along with the transmission lines, you're talking an expense that just is astronomical. Whereas you could take, if you really look into it, I did not come to this by, by stupidity. I came to it by the evidence. I've been looking more at Helen Caldicott's views on nuclear power, and I'm finding they're to be thoroughly debunked. I want you to Google right now a gentleman by the name of Thorium, I mean, of, of Gordon McDowell, who's done several videos effectively debunking Helen Caldicott's claims to nuclear power. I'd like you to take a look at the Thorium Energy Alliance's website, because Dennis, what you're telling me is not true. What I have been finding out is that there's a lot of stable scientists out here who have a better way of doing nuclear power, which is going to have to be done in conjunction with a lot of the solar, a lot of the wind, and a lot of the other renewables that we're doing. The problem is, a wind turbine goes up. It's a 12-year payback before any power coming out of it that's required to go into it. In other words, it takes 12 years before you see any net energy payback from it. The cost of materials, the cost of things, it's, it's astronomical. I do not understand how an environmentalist can have a whole state full of windmills and solar panels when we can get it safely in a, in a size room like this powering the entire north side of the city of Chicago. What you need to look at when you look at thorium reactors, it's a different way of doing power. Now, there are commercial companies out there doing it right now. Thorcon is one of them out of Canada. You're talking Flybe Energy out of some. They're predicting they'll have these reactors online within about four years. Second of all, it's much easier. Yes, a lot of what we're doing now with nuclear is not the best way to do it, but I better cut off because I'm out of time. It's okay. It's okay. Whew. I gotta get my stuff here. There's been a lot of fingerprints. I've heard of Chernobyl and it's wrong. There's not been one person killed in Chernobyl due to the radiation, except for a few workers that went in and okay, did Okay, you had your time, no, sir. I'm now sorry, you're right, right, you're right, you're right, you're right. <laughs> okay. There's been a lot of uh, speculation, and that's what it is, about how Trump managed to become President of the United States. Perhaps the most unlikely candidate in living memory, a guy who was seen by many two years ago as simply an overprivileged buffoon, was able to take over the government of the United States, perhaps with a little bit of aid from the Russians. The Russians love to stick their nose into any business that they can. Look at what's been happening in Eastern Europe lately. It's no accident that Lithuania has found it necessary uh, to consider seriously reinstating the draft. It's no accident that Sweden, uh, a country that hasn't been noted for its uh, bellicose activities in the past 200, 300 years, 
is uh, all of a sudden seriously considering reinstating a draft. But the truth of the matter is, Trump became president because the two parties, the two major parties, fell down on the job. The Republican Party, we can understand. They are the party of the privileged. They are the party of the well-to-do. No question about that. On the other hand, the Democratic Party, which since the days of Franklin Roosevelt, was supposed to have been the party of the working man and woman. It was supposed to have been the party of the defenseless. It was supposed to have been the party most sympathetic toward the union movement. And what have we seen? In recent years, the Democratic Party has become, in most of the United States, has become Wall Street, has become, uh, you know, really a privileged preserve for the very, very well-to-do where you cannot tell a Democrat from a Republican these days because both seem to have the same ideology, both seem to worship the same God, Maman. The truth of the matter is that the United States needn't worry particularly about our enemies from without. We can speculate from now until tomorrow morning as to who did 9-11. We can speculate to what degree the Russians were aiding and abetting a campaign uh, to undermine uh, Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton was only a bit player in this particular drama. The real sabotage took place when the Democratic Party forgot the people that it was representing, supposed to represent. And also, some blame has to come to the unions. I am a longtime union member. I have been a union organizer. I have been secretary uh, and uh, 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 general chairman of the Lerner uh, Newspaper Guild, which is part of the AFFL-CIO. But, so those are, those are my credentials. But the fact of the matter is that the unions have become too comfortable. For years, from the 1950s all the way up until the unions started unraveling about 15, 20 years ago, everyone assumed that this was a gravy train which was going to continue on and on and on forever. The truth of the matter is that unionism in this country has had a history which shows that unless you maintain your vigilance, unless you stay active, you're going to unravel. And that is why we have half, half of the union members uh, in the United States. That's half of what we had 30 or 40 years ago. This is, this is unnecessary. This is why one of the reasons why the living standards of the Americans has gone down and down and down. Uh, does it have to be? No, it's not too late. It's not too late for the Democratic Party and other progressive groups to stop, come down from their ivory tower, get down to the real business of what a government in the, of the United States is supposed to be about and what uh, civic responsibility in the United States involves and get back to basic grassroots organizing, get back to uh, more carefully vetting our politicians, and as a matter of fact, I think my time is up. Uh, anyway, folks, think about it. Uh, we'll talk later. Thank you. Charlie gets the last one. Charlie, you get the last one. Yeah, Charlie, go ahead. All right. Charlie. Hey. Charlie. Charlie. All right, let's thank our speaker. All right, I'll be eclectic as usual. We're going to, Tim and I are going to talk. It's somewhat relevant. And I've been researching uh, this topic is uh, uh, the accuracy of information. We're going to be talking specifically about fake news and the history of the United States going back uh, to the Revolution. Um, and this is certainly relevant uh, 
particularly relevant today when we have a president uh, who says things that are on face value not absolutely categorically not true or completely inaccurate. And then he has spokespersons, a variety or any number of them who come forth and give us some sort of explanation of how or why this is in fact true and tries to validate the statements, sometimes not very well done. Um, regarding some of these things, um, like the conspiracy theories there, um, I, I don't know if you're aware of something called the theory of the case. And you have a theory of the case, but you don't have a case. Um, you, 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 you have like what you claim to be evidence, but you have no witnesses to testify one way or another. Uh, what's amazingly enough, you're relying on the, you, what you keep using the term ed, forensic evidence, evidence, evidence. When there's no need to rely on that because you had first person participation. I myself saw or witnessed the events transpire. It's, I, I kept thinking I belong in the archaeological society and last week I was at a lecture and you come across an ancient site and you, you rely upon artifacts or you excavate structures and then you have to be very cautious about making generalizations about what activities took place or why these things are there. And, but you don't, this is not an archaeological site. This is downtown New York at a time and place that is contemporaneous. Uh, there's, and then to say, well, all of your contemporary information is inaccurate or invalid wholesale. Absolutely, you're doing exactly what these spokesperson for Trump are doing. And regardless of what he says, it's, there's some validity to it, you know. And whatever the whatever you saw in the news is invalid. This is quite a burden here. The, the, now the burden of proof shifts on these things, and the burden of proof lies on the nullifiers in this. And it's not simple. And when, in the absence of all, you could you have theories. Theories, what I call, is there a gardener? You come along and you find the garden. And you say, well, is there a gardener? And then you're describing the gardener and telling me how tall he is and whether he's a man or a woman and going on and on and on. And I'm going, you have no validity right to make these assertions because you're, you're not even surmising that there is a gardener. And that's what I mean. You're left on, on these things. The other thing about some of the articles, you're a newspaper guy. You ever run into an editor who didn't like your story, Pat? Uh, yes, I did. And he told you to redo it? Yes. Or did he ever take it and throw it out? Yes. When I, when I wrote my first story as a young editor in high school, the editor took my story, crumpled it up, and threw it away. Oh. Now, some of these stories, you've got to be cautious. You're the editor responsible for publication. Are you going to publish something on health and medicine? that may affect people's lives. And you say, well, they didn't run this story. Was it suppressed? Or was it just exercising judgment? Now, do you know anything about biology or microbiology or As immune much. systems or biochemistry? Uh, I, know, <laughs> I know a little, but that's yeah, only because but, enough, but that's what I'm saying. I would say, listen, this topic is way beyond the ability of the staff of most newspapers. And I'm not going to publish anything that could put, be potentially injurious to someone's health. And that's, that's, you just don't do that. Now to take a story like that, and if you want to kill it, I'd kill it right away. I wouldn't, I wouldn't allow you to have it in my newspaper. I'm sorry. And you get called, well, let me finish. We got time, there's nobody here. And you say, oh, well, you're, you're, Charlie, you're not allowing the truth you're a conspirator. No, I'm not. 
because there's limits to our knowledge and there's areas that you have to access, there's ethical issues at stake on these stories. You know, what do you guys? I was only going to say that, uh, Charlie, for once, you and I are in agreement on this. Uh, I happen to feel that a reporter who does not have a uh, background in that field, I mean, look, I'm a reporter who's covered a lot of stuff, okay? Uh, on the other hand, uh, I would not fault an editor for taking a paper or a story that I had written on proctology, let's say, and throwing it in the wastebasket <laughs> because the fact is that although I may be accused of spewing a lot of BS, I am certainly no uh, expert on proctology or the substances that it's connected with. And, all right, come on, Charlie. All right, all right he's, got, he's getting me out of here. Well, where was the guy that said we got to get a Facebook? There's the least accurate source of information in the world. There's no, that's nonsense. All right. That's written by an idiot. Okay. All right, Andy, go ahead. Well, hello, people. We'll do a quick wrap up here. All right. Hey, hey, can, can, let us wrap it up. Wrap it up. Hold on. We're, we're getting short on time here. Uh, thank you all for coming. They turned it off. And some of you, thank you for demonstrating what I wrote in an article back in about 2010, 2011. I've been giving presentations here since 20, 2007. Wow. The five subjects that we listed here, other than um, you know the, the election of Donald Trump, uh, political is recent, but the stolen elections uh, the, uh, and these other four, the database of peer-reviewed solid evidence was solid in 2007, yeah. 10 years ago. Since that time, tons more published peer-reviewed evidence has been published by scientists all over the world who are qualified. There are investigative journalists who have expertise in the medical field or in the physical field. Uh, in, in, uh, Celia Farber, for one. Uh, Pat and Charlie, uh, look up a woman named Celia Farber. She's an investigative journalist that has been investigating and reporting on the doctors what they've been doing on AIDS for over 20 years. She's not somebody that has no experience in the field. There are other uh, qualified journalists, dozens of them, that have been publishing stuff all over the world that is blacked out here. Okay. Thank uh, several people in the audience, as I said, uh, have shown us what it's like when a person is standing in a blizzard of evidence claiming they can't see a single snowflake. I call it standing in a blizzard. Uh, the question is not whether the evidence is real. The question is when is a person going to pull themselves out of living in a, a, a cult-like bubble of mythology and face, face the reality of the facts right in front of their face. That's the problem we have in America today, that on many of these subjects, people simply utterly refuse to face reality that's overwhelming it's what I call the Catholic Church Syndrome. Yeah. How many kids could have been saved if half the people in the congregation would have stepped forward and joined the others and said, we have to investigate this. We have to stop, stop uh, saying, oh, that can't be true. You're slim, like Tim says, you're slandering the man, so that can't be true. The evidence is not real, or what Charlie says. Until the criminal steps forward, until that pedophile comes forward and says, yes, I molested these kids, we're not going to look at any evidence from the hundreds of people that are giving us eyewitness testimony and first-person experiences. As far as 9-11 goes, there's thousands of eyewitnesses in New York that saw exactly what happened. The firefighters for 9-11 Truth, their videotapes show that the surviving firefighters watched the layers of explosives going off in all the buildings that were demolished that day. There's no question that that's what happened. There is no question that the plane crashes and whatever they were in the jet fuel had nothing to do with the explosive demolition and complete pulverization of the Twin Towers and the other five buildings. Building three, incidentally, just disappeared. 
it was turned into dust and there was virtually nothing left on the ground. Um, Dennis, uh, one thing Dennis said about uh, nuclear power, what Tim misses is the issue of one thing. There's two things about nuclear power you need to know. Since Since this book was published in 1980, it's called Brittle Power. Nuclear power has a problem. Any kind of nuclear power plant, where it's thorium, uranium, you name it, it's a central power plant, a central source, a concentrated source. It's a Trojan horse on the ground of any country that has it. Any country operating nuclear power plants can be eliminated as a place for human habitation with a dozen properly outfitted motorcycles. In 1985, there was an article published talking about the blast power of the Hiroshima weapon has been condensed down to the size of something on football you can carry around in a purse. A dozen properly outfitted motorcycles with a dozen of those things driven up to nuclear power plants and set off with cell phone calls would eliminate the United States as a place to live. That's why people have been adding nuclear and calling for the shutdown of the nuclear power industry, because there is no defense and no cleanup that can ever be done about a nuclear power plant that's scattered into the wind by a backpack nuke delivered okay. by a suicidal motorcyclist. The title of that article was incidentally okay. about 12 properly outfitted motorcycles was Kawasaki lets the good times roll. Okay. There Andy, we are. We're going to have to shut off, Andy. Okay, give me uh, one last minute. Um, so, the last thing you need to know about where we are, there's a total revolution of solar and wind power. And as far as energy in the future, the country can go solar and efficiency very fast. If you need kilowatts and you want a, a megawatt of power, you can get a megawatt of power out of wind and solar for one-tenth the cost per megawatt of the new nuclear power plants with thorium if they prove to be industrially reliable. But the reason thorium was abandoned was it's a high temperature way using molten salt, which is very corrosive. That book, Brittle Power, spells out that the more complex anything becomes, the more complex it becomes, the more chances you have for unforeseen types of failures that you can't be foreseen. Nuclear power is a, a total financial disaster. No country in the world is, is talking about privately funding building new nukes. That is a fantasy promoted for various political reasons. Like to talk about Yugoslavia and Alliance. Okay, that, let's wrap it up. All Thank right. you all for coming. And we'll give Andy a round of applause. All right. Have a look south, Andy. Okay, that's it. We're gambling out. Anybody wants further information, come see me or ask for a reference.